If you want to upgrade your car audio system, you've likely considered adding an aftermarket amplifier. Doing so gives you more power to work with for more output, but that added power also means the amplifier won't need to strain as much as your factory system would, allowing for far cleaner sound. But when picking an amplifier, there are obviously many different solutions out there. You want to be sure that you understand all of the features amplifiers have to offer so that you can pick the best option for you, but you also want to understand all of the different different settings on the amp so that you can get the most out of your new upgrade with correct installation and setup. Hey everyone, I'm Mark. Welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the channel where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. Let's get into it, a crash course on car audio amplifier basics. Here I have a plethora of different amplifiers set up so that we can explain all of the basics. The first thing that you need to know is that there's different categories of amplifiers fire. First off, you're going to have subwoofer amplifiers, which are commonly referred to as monoblock amplifiers. These are called mono amplifiers because they're going to take a left and right signal in, and they're going to sum that into a mono channel, and you're going to have one channel of output. It's worth noting though that sometimes on these mono amplifiers, you will see two sets of outputs. These are actually wired together internally. That's what that little line between those means. And this just gives you some wiring flexibility for if you're adding multiple subwoofers or if you're using subwoofers with multiple voice coils. And that's a good point to bring up. Don't be confused. Just because it's a mono amplifier doesn't mean that you can only power one subwoofer. You could have one subwoofer connected to this. You could have a hundred subwoofers connected to this. The point is, is that it's one channel of output. Now, when you are wiring subwoofers to an amplifier, it is critical that you wire them at the correct impedance. If you're unsure what that means, I have a full video all about that that I'll link up in the corner of the screen, but also down in the video description. And a quick side note, throughout this video, I'm gonna make reference to other videos that we have here on the channel. You guys can find all of those linked down below. The next category is multi-channel amplifiers. And you guessed it, this means that we have more than one channel, we have multiple channels. In the case of this amplifier here, the JL Audio XDM 800 slash eight, we have eight channels of amplified power. And on this one, this is the Focal FDP 4.600. This gives us four channels of amplification. The advantage of multiple different channels is now we can send a signal that is different information on each of those channels. So as an example, with this four channel amplifier, we could have front left and front right, but then rear left and rear right. This allows us to retain the fade control from front to rear in the vehicle and send obviously different information for front left, front right, rear left, rear right. Now we don't necessarily have to use a four channel amplifier in that configuration. Instead, we could do something that's called running active. We could have the front left tweeter on channel one, the front right tweeter on channel two, and then the front left woofer on channel three and front right woofer on channel four. The point is with a multi-channel amplifier, we have flexibility and that's why you might want more than four channels. You might want a six channel amp, an eight channel amp and so on. Now, a quick side note, the amount of channels that you have doesn't necessarily correlate with the amount of speaker drivers that you're going to be using. And that's because sometimes you may elect to run a component set passive. What that means is that you would use a passive crossover to divide up the signal. A really simple example here would be a two-way component set that has a woofer and tweeter. You're only going to send it one channel of information through the crossover, which then divides that signal up into the correct frequencies for both the woofer and tweeter to receive. Something else worth noting is that multi-channel amplifiers can be bridged. You can see it says bridged down there. What that allows us to do is get more power out of a pair of channels by bridging them together. So as an example with this eight channel amplifier, maybe I want to use the first six channels for the tweeters and mid-range speakers and woofers, but then maybe I want to have channels seven and eight power a subwoofer. I need a little bit more power. I could actually do this with this 
and bridge those channels together, again, making sure that I match the correct impedance. So we've got mono amplifiers, we've got multi-channel amplifiers, and the next category here, it's kind of also considered a multi-channel amplifier, but I would define it more as a full system amplifier, and that's amplifiers like this one here, that you have four channels of amplified power, for the speakers, and generally those are all the same amount of power, but then you have a larger power output for a subwoofer channel. So in a way, these full system amplifiers kind of combine a multi-channel amplifier with a mono amplifier. Also worth noting, we're starting to see more amplifiers on the market that have a staggered power approach. And what that means is you may see the first two channels are a lower power output than the next two channels. And the reason for that is if you're running an active system, your tweeters generally don't need as much power. The tweeters are playing the high frequency information. Having that staggered power output can be be advantageous. Now really quick, a side note, when you're shopping for amplifiers, you're of course going to want to compare and contrast all of the different features. And a really good resource for doing this is our show sponsor, Crutchfield. On the Crutchfield website, click the compare button next to each item and then see all details. Here you can easily compare the items, in this case amplifiers, but also get a breakdown on each of the different details. As an example for amplifier class, you can see the explanation here for the two most common amplifiers classes, Class D and Class AB. Even better yet, you can save on your next purchase with Crutchfield with the special car audio fabrication fan offer linked down in the video description. So getting back into it, we have mono amplifiers, multi-channel amplifiers, full system amplifiers, and then a category of its own, we have DSP integrated amplifiers. DSP stands for digital signal processor. So what this means is generally with these amplifiers, you're going to connect via a computer or via an app on your phone or mobile device, and you're able to actually tune all of the settings independently through software. You'll notice on DSP amplifiers, we really don't see any of these physical adjustment knobs, and that's because we do all of the settings in software. Now, while normal amplifiers usually only give us some control over crossover and input sensitivity and a few other integration type settings, DSP amplifiers allow us to do what's called time alignment, but also equalization of all of the output channels. The way that I always explain this to people that are new to car audio is imagine you were building a performance vehicle and you were swapping out all sorts of different performance mods, upgrading the engine, changing the exhaust, changing all these parameters. Obviously with all those changes, you're going to want to remap the ECU. You need to tune the vehicle to get the best performance out of all those upgrades. The same is true for car audio. When you're upgrading the speakers, the amplifiers, and different components in the vehicle, subwoofers also, you want to be able to have control over how all of those things perform, and you need to do that through full tuning in order to get the most optimal results. Now it's worth noting that you can still use these normal amplifiers and add DSP into your system, the DSP is just going to be its own standalone unit, and it's going to exist between your source unit and the amplifier in the signal chain. Also worth noting, a DSP amplifier can fit into each of these different categories. You could have a DSP integrated subwoofer amplifier. You could have a DSP integrated multi-channel amplifier. And in this case right here, I actually have a DSP integrated full system amplifier. This is a five channel amplifier. On that fifth channel, it has more power output for a subwoofer. Now, when you're evaluating what amplifier you wanna choose for your application, you of course want to consider the power output of the amplifier for your system. We discuss this in more detail in our full how to choose an amplifier video. Now, it may be a little bit intimidating at first, but with all these different amplifiers, you obviously see that there are many different connections that need to be made. So let's run through the basics. First off, we have our positive 12 volt battery connection. This connection is going to be a constant lead that is connected to our battery terminal. Now it is critical that we have a properly sized 
fuse on that wire in order to protect the wire and also that we size the wire correctly. Again, you're gonna to wanna to check out those full detailed videos down below. Next up, we have the ground connection. This is typically going to connect to the body or chassis of the vehicle. And something I really wanna point out there because it's a common first timer mistake is you wanna make sure that your ground wire is sized the same as your power wire. I've seen before where people think that, oh, all the power is used up by the amplifier, by the power wire coming in, so it's not as critical for the ground wire to be large, that is incorrect you need to have that sized correctly as well. Next up is the remote connection. Now don't forget that our 12 volt constant connection here is constant, which means it always has voltage. So we need a way to tell the amplifier when to turn on and off. And we do that with the remote connection. This is usually simply just a switched 12 volt lead that comes on at the same time as the radio in your vehicle. Now next up, we need a way to get signal into this amplifier in order to amplify it. And that's done with with our signal inputs. Virtually all amplifiers will have these RCA line level style inputs, which allows you to connect a signal to an aftermarket source. And depending on the amplifier model, sometimes you can also send in a high level speaker level source on those as well, which means you would be integrating with the factory system. A quick side note, that's the reason for this switch here, the input voltage switch that you'll find on some amplifiers. Now we of course also need a way to send that amplified signal out of the amplifier to our subwoofers or to our speakers, and that's simply done with the speaker wire connections. The final common connection you're going to see is for some sort of auxiliary control. Different manufacturers call it different things. In this case, this is the remote level control. On this one, it's the sub control. Back to this one, again, remote level control and so on. The point of that connection is it allows us to install a knob or controller up in the front of the vehicle that we can easily access to independently control a level output of certain channels. In most cases, that is for independent subwoofer control. But some amplifiers do give us some flexibility on what it can control. As an example, on this amplifier here, we can use it to control all channels, so it could be a total system volume. We could use it to control channels five through eight, or we could use it to control just channels seven and eight. Lots of different flexibility depending on the amplifier. We've covered the different categories of amplifiers, all of the different connections. Now we need to have an understanding of the different settings that are commonly available on these amps. First off, the gain control, which is also frequently referred to as input sensitivity or level. I cannot stress this enough, the gain control is not a volume knob. And for all those people that you've heard say, I only have my system at half gain and it sounds so good. That literally means nothing. That doesn't mean 50% power. It doesn't mean 50% volume. It's not a volume control. The gain or input sensitivity matches the amp's input level with the source unit's output level. The reason that you wanna set the gain control correctly is because if it's incorrectly set, you can send a clipped signal to your speakers or subwoofers. In fact, this is the most common issue that results in a subwoofer or speaker failing. We wanna make sure that we get this setting correct. Now, a feature that you may want to look out for is some amplifiers have a light and a procedure that will allow you to correctly set the gain. On this amplifier here, this light is actually around the dial itself. But if you do get an amplifier that doesn't have that light, you're not out of luck. There is a procedure that we can use to do this. I cover this in my full amplifier tuning video. Again, link down below. Another common setting to see is a turn on mode switch. And this assists us with integration because sometimes your vehicle may not have a switch 12 volt lead that we can easily use Use to tell the amplifier to turn on. Instead, some of these amplifiers will actually monitor the incoming signal, and when it detects a signal is coming into the amplifier, then it knows to turn on. That setting is something that you see on some amplifiers and not others, so you want to evaluate if you need it depending on if you have that switched 12 volt lead available. Another common setting to see on most all amplifiers is a crossover control. 
With your amplifier, you need to be able to limit the frequency bandwidth of information that is going to the speaker or subwoofer. In this case, on this subwoofer amplifier, we have a low pass crossover. And what that means is everything below this crossover set point will be allowed to go past. In other words, right now we are set at 80 hertz, so this means all of the frequency information below 80 hertz will be sent to our subwoofer. You might also see crossovers labeled as HP, which stands for high pass crossover. In this case, everything above that set point will be allowed to go past. And this is advantageous for things like mid-range speakers and tweeters in our system. Obviously, we don't want our tweeters to play bass information. It could quickly destroy them, so we can limit that bandwidth of frequency with the high-pass crossover. Now, you might also see a switch that is labeled as BP, which stands for band pass. In that case, with a band pass crossover, we're allowing the information to go past between the two different set points. You would use this on something like a mid-range speaker where we don't want it to play subwoofer bass information, but we also want to hand off to a tweeter for the high frequency information. Again, different amplifiers, you're going to see different ways this setting is controlled. Sometimes you can even turn off the crossover and you might want to do that if, again, you have a separate DSP unit in the signal chain that you're going to be using to control all of the crossovers within the DSP itself. And the reason you would want to do that is with a DSP, a lot of times you're going to have far more control. So you may just want to turn off the crossovers on the amp altogether and control them in the DSP. Another common setting to see is for phase. This allows you to control the transition point between different speaker drivers so that you have a good phase relationship between the two. And another common setting to see is a bass boost, which is basically just an EQ at a certain low range frequency. We can boost that as needed if we want to get a little bit more bass performance. Sometimes it's also just simply referred to as EQ. And you can see in this case, it's at 40 hertz. And with 40 hertz being in the subwoofer range of information, essentially it's also the same thing as a bass boost. Another quick note on that setting, that's another potential source for clipping. So you want to make sure that you set that correctly. So now that you understand the basics, I'd recommend diving into some of the more advanced detailed videos here on our channel. There's tons of videos here. One is focused on the best practices for amplifier installation, and another is focused on how to properly set all of the settings. Check those out here on screen, and also don't forget to check out our show sponsor, Crutchfield, for your next car audio purchase. You can also save on that purchase with the special car audio fabrication fan offer linked down in the video description. A big thanks to them, along with Jerry and the rest of the Patreon membership team for making these videos possible, and thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching.